Okay, good evening. Welcome. Uh, welcome to our first project conversation series organized by the American Institute of Architects in Hong Kong. My name is Su Chang and I am a co-chair of the programs committee of AIA Hong Kong. Uh, first project is a new initiative of AIA Hong Kong this year. And we invite architects and designers to reflect upon how, how they started the practice and how that beginning led to the architectural adventures they're in now. So tonight we're excited to welcome Tony Chencho and Stephanie Little, co-founders of Chencho Little Architects in Sydney. When I was first introduced to the work by a friend, Jay, who used to work for Tony and Stephanie, um, I, I found that there's a very special, say, smell of Australia as in my imagination, because me and myself never been to Australia, that I, I, I can feel when looking at their work. And they always reminded me of my all time favorite Australian invention, which is the flat white coffee, um, which is smaller in volume with less, you know, microphone, the um, higher proportion of co coffee to milk. And that um, has a little bit more of a consistency and velvety compared to say the American, you know, flat white you know, latte um, and uh, compared to latte. And I think the atmosphere consistency, lightness, um, airiness, and then there's also a sense of pleasure uh, when I look at the work can always be uh, found, you know, when I was drinking, you know, the flat white or looking at your work um, in Australia. And then I want to say this, like Chencho Little as a practice, uh, received many awards and recognition, including being the first firm in Australia to be included in Architecture Records International Design Vanguard um, in 2010, winning the New South Wales Australian Institute of Architects Residential Awards in 2012, winning the National Houses Awards in 2015, um, and winning the Commercial and Interior Architecture Awards in 2016. And I think this evening, we will continue our format of a conversation. And after the presentation, Tony and Stephanie will be joined by Sun Yi, a young architect based in Hong Kong. And we would love to invite all our audience to submit questions or topics you would like us to discuss through our Q&A or chat box on Zoom. Welcome Yi, welcome Stephanie and Tony. And please start anytime when you are ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chang, um, for the introduction and uh, for inviting us to present our work tonight. Um, and uh, I love your analogy uh, with coffee. Um, Australians, as you know, take their coffee very, very seriously. So um, I think we're, we're second to uh, Italy in terms of the amount of coffee we drink. So it's a good analogy. So, um, so um, Chang has asked us to um, talk about the beginning of our practice. Uh, our first project and how this has influenced the development of our work since. So um, Stephanie and I met at the University of New South Wales in Sydney over 25 years ago. So we now have a practice of um, 10 people. We started our degree at the time of a massive construction boom in Sydney, but unfortunately by the time we graduated in the 1990s, maybe we should share screens too, actually. Um, there we are. Okay, so, so by the time we graduated in the 1990s, the property bubble had burst and the construction industry had largely ground to a halt and the architects like us, you know, we were unable to find work. So after five years of study, we graduated with little prospect of a job. We decided instead to start out our own practice and take on whatever projects we could to make ends meet. The only problem was that we had no portfolio of built work little work experience and a few business connections. Australian clients are generally very conservative and very risk adverse. Our industry is highly regulated with a strong legal system. We realized very quickly that we needed to build something, anything, before potential clients would have the confidence to engage us for future work. We started attracting developers, but we quickly learned that they were only interested in our low fee and not the quality of our work. They only engaged us for partial services and we were quickly or quickly replaced us with a cheaper consultant for the later stages once they had received or accepted our design concepts. 
In Australia, architects' first projects are typically, typically alterations and additions to existing houses. These projects are often one of the largest investments those clients will ever make in their lifetime. As such, they carry with them great expectations and emotions. Our first completed project came out of a chance meeting at a friend's wedding. We met the son of a couple who wanted some work done to their holiday home in the Blue Mountains, uh, which is an area just outside Sydney. Ironically, the first client who was willing to engage us, despite our inexperience and the associated risk, was a former Chief Justice of the High Court, the highest legal position in Australia. During our time working with him, he also sat on the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. He was also the Chancellor at the University of New South Wales, where we studied. So before we met him, he had already spoken to the Dean of Architecture at our university and checked out our credentials. Fortunately, we had done quite well at the university and won a few student awards. So he agreed to um, engage us for his small project. The brief um, for his house was for a simple kitchen and bedroom addition to the heritage house on a large suburban lot. We consider many approaches. Should we completely contrast the new work to the old or propose an addition which was recessive and restrained so as not to detract from the original Spanish mission style house. Our university taught us to communicate our ideas through drawings. A legal judge, we realize, communicates almost exclusively through words and finally crafted legal arguments. To our dismay, most of our meetings were to be carried out over the phone. We recognized that we would have to find a way to present our work in words. We couldn't rely on images we had to verbally argue our case and justify our decisions, after which our client would consider our response and make a judgment. This was no easy task with one of the most esteemed legal minds in our country. Neither design option seems to translate into an arguable case. Instead, by tying our response to the specifics of the program and the site, we were able to develop a strong argument for our design. The scheme we eventually arrived at was more nuanced, site-specific and contextual. We followed the ridge and gutter lines from the original house through into the addition. We replicated the width of the colonnade walls into the new walls and reduced the architectural components into three clearly discernible elements, the roof, wall and the podium. One blade wall extends out to complete a northern courtyard and the new garden steps provide a place to sit in the sun and to also enjoy the garden. Our solution was an abstraction of the original building elements of the house and deferred to it. But it at the same time created an addition which was open, light filled and connected to the garden in contrast to the introverted dark spaces of the original house. Where the original rooms of the dwelling were shut off from the garden, the new addition to the, drew the garden into the space so that the green of the adjacent pine hedge and the maple tree became part of the interior. The detailing was highly integral to the reading of the building and the experience of the space. The glass appears to hang from the roof and dissolves the enclosure such that the roof appears wafer thin. The structure is revealed or concealed to maximize the appearance of lightness and emphasize the effect of the tent light roof. There is an ambiguity between enclosure and openness. The lightweight roof is accentuated by the heaviness of the enclosing walls. The capping of the walls is detailed flush to ensure that the walls read as abstract elements. This play of perception and effects through obsessive detailing was something we have carried into our later work. Through the process, the client taught us the parallels between a legal judgment and the work of an architect. He saw his role as a judge to bring together many disparate elements and pieces of evidence into a case, into one clear, logical and well-formed argument. He taught that an architect's role, or he thought that an architect's role was very similar. An architect was required to bring together many conflicting and disparate elements in a project, the client's brief, the budget, the planning codes, the construction requirements, the site, the climate, and so on, into a singular clear outcome. This has remained a strong focus of our practice ever since. A majority of our work after this first project has been on single dwellings in the suburbs of Sydney. 
Australia is a highly urbanised country with most people living in the suburbs rather than the romanticised outback context notable in the work of Glenn Merkett and others. Atypically, I actually grew up in the outback of New South Wales on a large agricultural property several kilometres from its nearest neighbour to fifth generation Australians. The house I grew up in is marked by a red dot on the map on the left. The western part of New South Wales is arid and very flat, red and dry, with extremely hot summers and very cold winters. Tony was born and grew up in the suburbs of Sydney, the son of migrants from Hong Kong, Hong Kong and Guangzhou in the house highlighted in the image on the right. The climate of Sydney is milder and more humid with over double the annual rainfall of my hometown. What struck us when we started out working together on housing was that the similarity between the houses we grew up in. We both grew up in brick veneer houses with tiled roofs. They had formal dining and living rooms at the front, which were almost never used, and large poorly constructed TV rooms um, tacked on the back where we spent most of our time. They each had a small porch and formal entrance at the front, but we always entered via secondary entry along a concrete side path. Despite the diversity of cultural backgrounds and geographic locations, our family homes were almost identical. They were both generic houses that were built with little thought and typical of houses built in almost every area of Australia. After the experience on the Mason House, we realized that a more site-specific and contextual response could result in more interesting and meaningful built outcomes, which could reinforce a sense of place and express the richness and diversity of Australia, its geography and its people. We wanted to really challenge the preconceptions and default responses which result in generic suburban housing. We felt that one way we could do this was by critically looking at the planning codes which shape them. Planning codes control height setbacks from boundaries, floor space, landscaped areas of all housing development. They reinforce the status quo and through their requirements often imply a certain built outcome. There is little meaningful difference in the codes in Australia from place to place or from one climate to another. Architect and writer Elijah Huge notes, codes charged with political, social and formal intent operate as the architecture of architecture, creating its preconditions and shaping its production. Sydney is divided into 32 local government areas. In New South Wales, planning codes are divided into two sets of documents, local environmental plans or LEPs, which are gazetted by the state parliament and are legal documents. They typically deal with zoning, subdivision and heritage items. And there's also development control plans or DCPs, which contain prescriptive design guidelines, such as wall heights, setbacks, envelope controls, floor space ratios, landscaped areas and private open space requirements. They do not carry the same legal status as the LEPs. However, judges in the Land and Environment Court have placed increasing weight on them over the last 20 years. The DCPs are a vehicle for councils to impose and project their ideal visual image of the built environment. The codes have become a de facto design code. Many architects in Sydney have adopted a confrontational approach and have challenged the planning codes in the Land Environment Court. Our experience with the court early in our career was not so productive. We found that consultant planners, as well as judges, would make design amendments in order to facilitate a consensus. In one case, a judge proudly admitted that he had thought up a solution during his morning shower. We quickly realised that a confrontational approach via the court resulted in compromised design outcomes. We then tried to comply with the objectives of the code. In doing so, we made minor breaches to the numerical standards. This approach wasn't successful either. The planners had to process a certain number of projects per month, and it would be easier for them to do this if they are able to just tick a box to confirm that a project complied with the precise numerical standard we recognized that we needed to change our approach. Rather than accepting that planning codes restrict creative expression, we began to look at planning codes obliquely as a way of moving forward, trying to find openings 
in order to clear a conceptual space for design creativity. We hope to find loopholes within them and in doing so find new ways of looking at the suburban house. We have therefore looked at codes for their creative potential as a vehicle to investigate contemporary architectural concepts in a suburban setting. In the semi-detached house, we look closely at council's floor space ratio and facade articulation codes. The client was a merchant banker who wanted maximum return for his investment. He believed that the best way to do this was to maximize the floor space. The floor space ratio limits the interior floor space of a building. This is the area of a building within its external enclosing walls. We realize that the code assumes a generic suburban house typology with a very distinct delineation between the inside and the outside. In the semi-detached house, we therefore focused on the interstitial space, a space that was not strictly inside or outside, as we realized that the code did not anticipate these. There was no limit in how big we could make an interstitial space. Council required us to mirror the enclosure of the neighboring semi-detached house, which we did. However, we added a layer of interstitial spaces around it to dramatically increase the perceived and usable space of the dwelling. We positioned an external aluminium louver suite on the outside of the interstitial space and continued the roof over. This resulted in an extra 100 square meters of floor space, which adds 30% to the overall floor area of the house. The client was very happy. The interstitial space helped us to strategize an alternate space, spatial model for a traditional semi-detached house typology. This space is made up of two operable layers. Each layer offered specific environmental, structural, spatial, and aesthetic solutions. Here the codes, the aesthetics, sustainable and spatial considerations are inseparable. Council also stipulated that a facade cannot be long, longer than 12 meters without articulation. Council advised that acceptable forms of articulation were window openings, changes in materials and stepping of the wall plane. Instead, we proposed horizontal louvers across the entire 28 meter length of the facade. The planners were reluctant to support this as they believed that it didn't correlate with the built image implied by the code. We highlighted that their code privileged a form of abstraction which relied on the relationship of solid to void through the use of traditional window and door openings. We suggested that there was another form of abstraction which could also meet the objectives of the code. Material abstraction emphasizes the capacity of the material to generate effects rather than the intrinsic nature of the material. This would be achieved through detailing and repetition to modulate the scale and intensity of the facade. We finally managed to convince the planners that the two forms of abstraction, montage and repetition, were different by degree rather than different in kind. They were not opposites, but could be seen as an extension of each other. In this project, material abstraction is achieved by positioning the horizontal steel members and louver blades in front of the columns to privilege the horizontal. The edges of the louver blades are detailed to align with the flanges of the beams and painted the same color to reduce them to the same visual order. The viewer then reads these two elements in relation to each other and experiences the facade as a textual surface. To further abstract the facade, scalable elements such as gutters and downpipes were hidden within steel beams and columns. As in our earlier Mason house, detailing is critical to the desired reading of the building and its effects. In the Kuji house, we used the council codes to generate a site-specific form, which was contrary to that implied by the code, but which strictly adhered to it. The Kuji house is located in the beachside suburb of Kuji. Because of its corner location and the steep topography, there are 18 neighboring houses which directly overlook the site towards the water. This is a highly litigious and contested area with neighbors battling to maintain and maximize their views. Privacy is further impacted by a public set of stairs which runs along the side of the house. The stairs link the upper residential areas to the coastline and are frequently used by screaming personal trainers throughout the day. The main design concerns were therefore to balance views and privacy 
the public and the private. The living room was placed on the top floor where the best views were available. The bedrooms are located at the ground level and the basement was designed as a self-contained retreat for the client's teenage children. A courtyard separates the garage from the main body of the house. We continued our exploration of interstitial space in the Coogee house to mediate between the public and private and increase the perception of space. The internal rooms of the house are wrapped in the interstitial, interstitial space, comprising balconies, external stairs, and an access bridge. The space recalls a vernacular veranda and provides the interior rooms with a layered buffer to the street, protection from weather and privacy, while still permitting cooling breezes. The screen is constructed of aluminium battens, which were carefully spaced to provide an optimum level of transparency while still retaining privacy. The interstitial space extends the internal spaces out to the line of the screens. The screens offer glimpses of the neighboring buildings as you can see in the image on the right. It does not fully exclude the neighborhood, but at the same time, privacy is still maintained. From the street, you can see glimpses of the interior, the occupants, the structural framing and precast concrete stairs. Our intention was not to shut the house off from the street, but encourage a nuanced connection to it. In this way, neither inhabitants nor passers-by suffer any sense of exclusion. The degree of translucency changes as you walk around the building. From a position directly in front of the screen, the screens appear open and translucent. As you move away from the central position and start to view the facade obliquely, it becomes increasingly opaque. The perceived depth of the facade changes with the viewer's position. These images show the changing appearance of the dwelling from morning to midday and nighttime. The perception of the building changes with the changing light patterns and levels. The screen not only has a utilitarian function, it is also ornamental, generating different effects from different viewing angles. The screens continue on each facade, but are openable towards the view and a central courtyard to allow the owner to control the amount of enclosure. Like the previous projects, the form of the house was strongly influenced by council regulations. The problem was, how could we fit a three-story building within a two-story height control? There were two height controls for the project, the max maximum building height and the wall height. If the sectional area is continued through to the elevation, a breach in the wall height limit of the amount shown in pink would result. By folding down the roof at the ridge within the interstitial space, we effectively reduced the wall height. The wall was now classified as a roof rather than a wall, and this helped comply with council's wall height control. We also cut out the top eastern corner of the screen, which further reduced the breach to a level which the local planning authority was willing to accept. To improve the views to a nearby island from the neighboring buildings, the local planning authority required us to display the corners of the plan. This requirement actually added to the visual effect of the screen. The resultant form specifically addresses the council regulations and the site topography, but was never anticipated by them. In the pitch roof house, one aspect of the planning codes became the dominant driver of the design process. Mossman Council is one of the most conservative councils in Sydney. Council's planning staff indicated that the site was located in a very sensitive area and that compliance with the codes, especially setbacks, view loss and roofscape would be important to, be, to obtain a planning approval. The code required pitched roofs as they were the predominant roof type of the area. This requirement is mentioned six times in the DCP under three different headings. Unfortunately, our clients disliked traditional pitched roofs. Our response was to play with the disjuncture between council's idealized image of a pitch roof and a contemporary interpretation of a pitch roof. We realized by creating a point of complication or conjuncture, we could comply with the codes and be able to explore contemporary design concepts. We proposed a roofscape that was made up of a series of triangles that not only pitched up, as in a traditional pitch roof, but also pitched down to form a faceted roof plane. 
The scaling of the triangles was important as we wanted to maintain a scale that was compatible with the neighboring pitch roofs. This was essential as there was a fine line between creating a roof that was integrated, integrated into the suburbs existing roofscape while at the same time being an invasive modification of a traditional pitch roof. For us, manipulating the faceted roof plane was not just a contextual or formalist exercise. Other parameters, parameters needed to be addressed. The requirements for northern sunlight and the need to merge the roof with the orthogonal courtyard plan below it. Surprisingly, the variability of the triangular geometry gave us freedom to push and pull the roof form as required to suit the various parameters. The triangular points of the roof aligned with the points of the orthogonal plan. The ridges and valleys follow the alignment of the sliding doors, so they slide without the use of horizontal transoms. Portions of the triangular roof were left out to allow sunlight into the north facing courtyard. We also chose to continue the triangular geometry from the roof onto the front and side elevations. The geometry became the basis for articulating openings on the facade of the building. The structural beams follow the geometry and continue down along all facades. We realized that structure could also become a spatial device to organize the external appearance and the internal spaces of the house with surprising spatial effects. You can see from the design process of these projects how seemingly benign council codes and constraints have become a generator of ideas and concepts which we believe are crucial to the final outcome and crucial to reimagining the suburban house. In each of these projects we have discussed, our exploration of the codes has resulted in site and client specific outcomes. The pitch roof house also revealed a new strategy to us. We realized working in suburban contexts that inputs in the design process were complex and were not fixed over the life of the project. The client's brief often developed over time. The council would enforce a new code or the ground conditions would require the use of a particular construction system. These were inputs that could not be determined at the outset. These inputs are only becoming more complex as years progress as our clients' briefs become more complex and as our projects become larger with larger consultant teams. Even for houses, we need around 15 consultants per project, each of which have an important bearing on the design process and the outcome. We therefore explored how we can develop a design strategy which will accommodate these various inputs into a very flexible but singular concept. This strategy, which we first developed in the pitch roof house, utilizing a geometric spatial system, allowed us a loose fit concept, which could be pushed and pulled as required to suit the various inputs. This system allowed unlimited variability. What started as a way of addressing strict planning codes via the pitch roof, developed into a spatial strategy, which we have continued into our more recent work. We realized this was another useful tool to deal with the suburban condition and address the particularities of each project. The suburban street grid is often set with little regard to topography, the position of the sun or the direction of the view. Yet a typical suburban house has a strong hierarchy between the front sides and back. The main openings of the generic suburban house are to the garden at the rear. But what if the main view is to the side of the house or the sunlight was more plentiful at the front? We wanted to develop a flexible strategy that allowed us to address the different conditions on each facade into a cohesive system. Even though the strategy was overarching, it allowed us the freedom to address each particular condition. So much like the legal judgment we discussed in our Mason house, this strategy gave us the framework to pull together disparate and conflicting elements into a singular rational outcome. This strategy was carried through into our recent work, including the Glebe house. <clears throat> the Glebe house was designed for a couple with three young children. It comprises four bedrooms within a floor area of 200 square meters a compact house by Australian standards. The housing is located in a suburb of Glebe, an inner city area of Sydney. The Glebe house replaces a single story Victorian cottage, which had unfortunately fallen into a state of disrepair. 
The adjacent buildings to the south and to the west of the site were Victorian terrace houses with ornate detailing. The row of terraces immediately adjoining the site contain elegant arch openings and curved ironwork filigree. The scale and the form of the building was determined by council's strict height and envelope controls, as well as the site geometry. The clients wanted to maximize the space available within this envelope. The major aims of this project were therefore how to design a building within a heritage context, while letting in adequate light to the center of this envelope and carefully framing views out to avoid the closely sighted neighboring houses. The client wanted a house filled with light throughout the whole day, and openness and connectivity between the floors, a very important aspect for their young family. As discussed earlier, we also wanted to establish a special strategy for our design, which was adequately flexible to allow us to adjust, push and pull as required to achieve these aims. Council required us to respond to the heritage context in order to obtain a planning approval, using the arch openings of the neighboring Victorian terraces as an inspiration. We started arranging arch cutouts on the envelope to explore spatial opportunities. We rescaled the arches. This folded out roof plan and elevation drawing shows the relationship of the final openings with the built form. We realized that an arch geometry could help us to frame and edit views of the surroundings. An upturned arch focused views to the canopies of the trees around the site while screening the neighboring windows, boundary fences and the street. The upturn arch also worked well to maximize light into the space as it was wider at the top of the wall where there was the most available sunlight. An arch could also be pushed and pulled to suit other different room sizes and heights. In the bathroom on the first floor, the arch windows are relatively small and have high seals to co conceal the bathtub. In this children's room, the arch windows are larger and continue down almost to the floor to act as a seat for the young son. In this bedroom, the arch window stops short to allow space for a study desk. And in the master bedroom, one window edits the outlook and frames the view to the pine tree. The smaller window aligns with the ensuite. We found that the arch geometry was flexible in both its traditional and inverted forms. The use of an arch opening therefore allowed us to apply a consistent and flexible geometry to all facades of the house. By responding directly to the historical context and rescaling the aesthetic elements, the outcome is new and unexpected. We also needed to ensure that the depth of the ground floor plate received adequate daylight. A large first a large curved void over the living and dining spaces aligned with the curved windows and floods the interior with diffuse sunlight. The void provides good connectivity between the bedrooms and the living levels, which was very important for the client's young family. Here, you can see the two curved voids over the living space. We chose to align the cutouts of the facade with the void cutouts in plan to generate spatial effects from the interrelationship and also to maximize light penetration into the living spaces in the center of the house. The three-dimensional space created between them is therefore reinforced and given it a heightened sense of volume, such that it appeared that the voids have been scoured out of a solid form. The voids give the public areas of the house an unexpected generosity within the constricted floor plate. The interrelationship of the openings on the corners also create spatial effects. These openings dissolve the corners of the space and give the space a aperspectival quality. In this corner of the children's study, the apex aligns with the corners to flatten them. These effects are enhanced by the addition of a void above the corner, which starts to dissolve the corner vertically as well as horizontally. In this external space, a void is added over the corner and the cutouts are also included in the concrete floor plate. Plants will grow through this place, with, through this space with similar plants also planted outside the wall, further eroding the perception and the definition of the corner and making the space they contain more ambiguous. The perimeter of the building is therefore continuous or encompassing and protecting without discernible extents. 
So while we began with a framework, which was infinitely flexible and plural to allow us to respond to the functional planning, detailing and the aesthetic requirements as they arose throughout the design process, the aim was also to have a design which is very singular, which each element reading as a set rather than as individual parts. Each part is subjected to an overall governing spatial strategy for the house. Fortunately, through our residential projects, we have received a number of state and national awards from the Institute of Architects. Our houses have been fe featured extensively in international magazines, including GA Houses, Casabella and Architecture Record. However, our success with housing did not organically translate into larger projects. After 20 years in practice, we had not had the opportunity to design larger buildings. We found ourselves back in the same position as we were in at the beginning of our practice. How do we get larger projects when we had no track record in larger buildings? It was only through a government policy that we were able to make the step up to larger projects. The apartment typology is probably one of the most constrained and challenging building types for architects in Australia. They are driven by direct market forces on one hand and strict design codes on the other. We were given our first opportunity to design a larger building of this type and scale thanks to the City of Sydney's competitive design policy. The competitive design policy require, requires a design excellence competition to be held if the proposed building is over a certain height, in this case 25 metres, or has a value greater than 100 million Australian dollars. In return, the developer receives a 10% bonus in floor space or height. This policy has impacted on the architectural landscape in Sydney by giving small and emerging practices like our own, the opportunity to design and build larger and more public buildings. For the competition, three competitors were each paid 20,000 Australian dollars to participate. Over six weeks, we were required to produce montage views and detailed plans and elevations with coordinated services and functioning cores. The site is located in the Lachlan precinct of Green Square, a large urban renewal area between the airport and the city. From the early 1800s, this area has been home to market gardens and a variety of industrial uses, such as brickworks, ropeworks, candle and soap factories, tanneries, breweries, and wool washers. In the 1950s, manufacturing declined or decentralized further west. As a result, Green Square is currently undergoing one of the largest urban renewal transformations in Australia to provide over 30,000 new apartments by 2030. This will provide one of the highest density precincts in the country. The precincts to the north and south of the site were developed in recent years with generic high density residential developments. Many of these developments were shaped by the state government's environmental planning policies, which control minimum cross ventilation and solar access requirements, room sizes, balcony sizes, and so on. Whilst these controls have improved the general quality of apartments, they have also resulted in a consistency in the appearance of apartment buildings, much like they do for single suburban houses. At the time of the competition, our site was a large cleared industrial block of land. The site had no built or landscape features. Even the road networks and the square fronting our site were yet to be constructed. Our challenge was how to create a sense of place and give meaning and purpose in this largely generic context. We started looking at the old geological and cultural history of the site. We found these historic maps, which showed that the site was once a wetland filled with freshwater creeks and swamps. This thriving landscape had been occupied by the indigenous Eora nation for thousands of years for fishing, hunting and foraging. We also realized that the square proposed in front of our building had been named Duralia Square after the Aboriginal word for brolga a wetland bird which once flourished on the site. We thought that referencing this history of the site would help to give our identity and meaning to our building, the design process and this new precinct. So we researched wetland structures, 
the structure shown here on the right is typical of the examples we found. The pier-like posts are angled to provide additional structural support in the weak foundations. We hoped an express structural system such as this would give the building a strong link to its wetland past. The idea of an express structural system also overcame our second challenge on this project, working for the first time with a developer who was also a builder. It was only after we had won the design excellence competition that we became acquainted with the developer's team. The developer's work at the time as seen here was very generic like most developers, they were interested in economy, efficiency, and speed of construction. It was clear at the outset that peripheral architectural features, such as high cost cladding materials and screens, were not going to survive the typical value engineering processes of this developer. Instead, we chose to rely on the express structure as an architectural feature, knowing that the structure could not be value engineered out. We hoped that in this way, the design integrity of our building could be maintained. So we took a standard concrete grid structure and through a number of manip manipulations, transformed it to replicate the wetland stilt structures. We built a series of models to test, develop and refine the structural concept. We collaborated with a structural engineer to develop a efficient solution which reinforced the architectural concept. We particularly like this 3D engineer's model as it demonstrates the continuity of the loads from the building's column into the ground. The columns extend to piles. They provide lateral stability to the building, much like the wetland structures we showed you earlier. Australian apartment buildings typically have their structure completely hidden behind a facade, such that the, the facade alone provides a main interface with the urban realm. Instead, here we have positioned the structure in front of the facade. In doing so, the structural skeleton of the building defines the architecture. It is the organizational principle and provides the aesthetic of the building. The angled columns provide a varied three-dimensional experience as you walk around the building. In this image of the Western facade, you read the effect of the crisscross columns in elevation. From Duralia Square, the Northern facade, we have designed the building to vary in appearance depending on the viewing distance. From the edge of the square, you read the simple rectilinear gridded structure in elevation. The grid aligns with the rooms in the apartments behind. From the middle of the square as seen in this image, you can start to see the columns subtly slide past each other in one plane. It is not until you view the building obliquely that the crisscross columns start to alter the appearance of the building. We have chosen to accentuate this effect further by subtly tapering the floor plates outwards towards the top and bottom of the building as seen in the edges on the left and right of these images. The building narrows down to the intersection point at the center and expands back out at the top and at the ground. The gentle concave edge to the building embraces the park and gives an unexpected aperspectival effect at close range. This concept also worked well in the urban context. The building had a street frontage on each of its three sides and the public square directly abutting it on the fourth. This created an unusually civic setting for a residential building. By providing a generous balcony on each facade of the building, it gave us the freedom to carefully address the threshold with the public domain on each side. The large balconies overlooking the square provide a setting for seeing and being seen, not unlike a theater set. The activity of everyday life is visible from the square and towards the square. The public square also forms part of the ground plane of the building. The ground plane is permeable and provides a publicly accessible pathway from the square through the footprint of the building to the retail streets behind the site. Just as the stilt structures, structures enable wetland flora and fauna to grow and move through and under them, we felt it was also important to imagine the ground plane of Duralia Square extending into the building so that it appears to completely flow under it. We therefore accepted the ground condition of the square and brought it into our site boundaries. The paving of the square is continued into the site to provide a seamless transition between the two areas. 
the retail spaces are set back as much as possible to maximize this in-between space. The awnings and colonnade on the edge of the building provide an ambiguity to this threshold, between the threshold between the public and private space. Privacy to the apartments was a foremost consideration in the design of the threshold with the square. We needed to balance the requirement for outlook from the apartments with the requirements for privacy. Balustrades were used to control the level of privacy to the apartments and their balconies. The balustrades shown here diminish in size the further you go up the building where privacy is less critical and are largest at the bottom where proximity to the public square and the requirement for privacy is at its greatest. The balustrades successfully conceal washing racks, bikes and miscellaneous outdoor furniture. The diminishing size of the balustrades further adds to the aperspectival effect created by the concave facade. Since this project, we have won another two design excellence competitions for similarly scaled buildings, an adaptable housing project and a commercial office project. Without the government's design excellence policy, we would never have had the opportunity to carry out this scale of project within an urban context. I would like to end on a photo of our first project, the Mason House, which we recently visited 20 years after it was first completed. It is always nice to come back to a project after so many years to find it well cared for and lived in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful lecture. Um, I want to welcome you to join us um, for a discussion. Maybe I could just start with a question that I have in my mind when I'm listening to your presentation. Um, so I wonder, um, because I think a house, you mentioned, uh, you, you introduced a lot about your experiencing in design, housing project or essential project, but also particularly house, a typology of a house and house as a type is small in size, but actually very difficult to, um, work with because it can get very personal for both the architect and the client. I wonder how you deal with these um, personal entanglement between you, your creativity and the client's desire and how to still maintain the idea of the house when you're designing them. Hmm. I, I think um, when we get approached by a client, um, a lot of the times they don't really know what um, that they understand the quantifiable aspects of the house, um, such as the number of rooms, the size of rooms, en suites, kitchens, and um, but also they they indicate to us, and since it's for their family, they describe how they want the family to to sort of relate to each other and, and function within that house, and that gives us clues, special clues in terms of how we relate spaces, um, one space to another space. Let's say, for example, um, some clients want the kitchen to be the center part of the house. Be, because that's where people congregate. Um, and that's something which is very evident in contemporary housing. So straight away, that gives us clues about where we can position the kitchen. And for example, in the Kuji house, they wanted the kitchen in the primary position where they can see the view of the ocean. It was the best uh, place to view the ocean. And that was part of their brief. So um, their the brief gives us clues and we don't normally start off with a preconceived image of of the house and we don't normally start off with a preconceived sort of architectural strategy either we basically um, use the client's brief um, to develop an architectural concept or to allow us to log on to sort of architectural precedences that we have learned you know through our education at university and and also when we you know are practicing because we always look at precedences um, so by doing it in that way the we, we're taking the client um well, it's important to take the client on the journey you know, from the very beginning, um, we realized in a very early, early on that if we start off with the project with a preconceived idea, the, the, the client, you know, they, they are quite astute. They, they realize that, you know, there is a sort of lack of connect, uh, connection between their brief and the desires and the outcome and the architectural outcome. So that's why it's very important to, to sort of um, ground your architectural um, strategies or the concepts within the client's brief and the site conditions. So if you approach it that way, we, we've never had any problems of, or any sort of disjunction, disjunction between 
you know, what we want or what the client wants, um, because we just don't start off with a preconceived image or yeah. concept. And that's very, very important is to somehow sort of empty yourself of any preconceived ideas to go to the site and really embrace the site and really embrace the client's brief. Uh, that's very, very important. Yeah. Again, I also really enjoyed this really lovely presentation and I just follow up your um, uh, your thoughts and so you will look up some precedent uh, cases when you uh, communicate with the clients. I actually curious to listen to both of you. Do you have a fair house that designed by the other architects during maybe your lifetime as, as a student also when you're working with your client? that you would like to pull off with um, show other clients or any um, fair house you have in your mind? Yeah, I, I guess the, the certain precedences or, or, or favorite houses that we show, um, they, they have to be related to that particular context, to the brief. So, so for example, um, you know, if, if for example, if, if the client does not like split level houses, uh, and, and their interrelationship of spaces where you rely on changing of levels like out of loose houses, I wouldn't show them an out of loose house because you know, they'd be horrified, especially of the elderly clients. But if they're interested in, in certain sort of attributes, I will show them precedences which address their, you know, their, their brief. I think that's very, very important. Um, it's not like we have a, we, personally, we do have favorite houses, but I think it's important. I've got too many. Too many. <laughs> to limit them. <laughs> But I think it's important to sort of the precedences that you show have to have to respond to their particular requirement to their brief. Then it makes sense to them. But more often than not, we look at precedence for a particular element. So we might be trying to resolve um, how a stair works. So we'd look at projects just for stairs or a downpipe. How how you can do the downpipe. So we're not looking at the precedent as a whole so much as certain elements more often than not. Um, yeah, so we use precedence to um, help develop detailing and the resolution of the design. So let's say, for example, we're, we're, we're designing a, a brick house at the moment um, on the coastline in Sydney. Um, so we basically, you know, for that client, we present precedences in terms of different um, way the bricks are laid you know whether the coursing is half half two thirds one third whether there are header courses every third cor uh, coursing um so we show what other architects have done like for example cruzo sengen um surgeon bates you know they use brick so again what stephanie says is that we won't show the whole project a, 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 as a whole spatial strategy but we look, we look at certain details and speak to the client through those details and through those images so if the client wants a more sort of abstract uh, brick house, you know, we will, we will start looking at eliminating, um, you know, for example, header courses around windows, for example. Um, and we will look at architects, which in terms of their brickwork becomes a lot more abstract. You know, like Peter Zumthor, for example, his, the way he, he details his brickwork, the way he sets out his brickwork, it's a lot more abstract than let's say uh, an architect like Sergeon Bates, you know, um, and then Caruso Sinjin is in between both of them. So we will look at precedences in that manner. And so we'll show them pictures and, and show them to the client. Um, and you know, we just go through that journey with the client and go, go through the exercise. And the client would say, well, perhaps, you know, I do like a more abstract uh, way of assembling the brickwork along my facade because it's a more contemporary, you know, I don't want my building look like, you know, looking like a traditional brick building that I've grown up in during my childhood. So we, we go through that sort of exercise with the client mm -hmm. and that's the way we use precedences. Maybe that's also um, a way to connect with a client and deal with, you know, this, um, have a conversation with a client. You go back to the first question I just had. Um, mm -hmm. about. Yeah, and we're almost hyper-rational in responding to precisely what um, the client wants. And we really use that as a, springboard for how we develop our designs. Um, I think we would be very challenged if we didn't have those sort of constraints because we actually thrive on those constraints and um, often develop our schemes out of them. So I'm going to, I'm going to read a uh, comments and the questions from an audience, Nelson, uh, Nelson Chen. Um, Professor Nelson Chen has this question. Thank you for your inspiring design 
presentation this evening. I was first made aware of your practice several years ago through your former professor, Stan Fong, mm -hmm. and uh, follow your work ever since. My two questions. Question one, how did you have the confidence, convictions, and courage to open your practice immediately after finishing school at the University of New South Wales? Um, the question two, what do you mean by a perspectival and how does it inform your design work? Mm. Well, I think the confidence in some way was in, misplaced. It, it, was, it was not confidence, it was just something which we had to do. It was um, out of necessity. There was no work. Um, um, I, I remember, you know, during the 90s, that there was, you know, there was, it, there was just completely no work for graduates. And we even knew of some colleagues who were driving taxis around Sydney. Um, it was that bad. And architects make good taxi drivers because we like to look at buildings around Sydney. So we make very good uh, taxi drivers. So it was really out of necessity. And, you know, it wasn't a really conscious effort to set up our practice as something which just happened. You know, we, we, we met uh, for a friend's wedding um, in a, a, a client, which happened to be the Masons, uh, the Mason house. Um, so it's really for necessity. And and in some way, our company has sort of organically grown since then. We're not the sort of practice which would have a, um, what do they call it? A uh, five-year plan. Five <laughs> plan or a 10-year plan. I want, to, I want to do this in 10 years. I want to have this much money. I want to have a practice this large. We're not that sort of practice, you know, but we're just sort of slowly. And we've always focused on the work rather than those sort of um, goalposts in terms of size of practice or um, size of yeah the buildings we do yeah. mm. so in terms of a perspectival um, what we mean is that you know there's a, there's a traditional way of looking at the perspective you know for a house uh, for example um, I think we talked about in the Glebe house where we dissolve the corner of the house um, you know through um, the arch opening and we do the same in the pitch roof house um, what we mean by a perspectival is somehow challenging the preconceived ideas of what you would assume a, a perspective of a corner would be. And we do that through geometry. Um, and, and in some way, a perspective is either going against a precon preconceived notion of what that space should appear like at the corner or at, or at the same time accentuating um, the effect of, 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 uh, of the space um, through sort of the angle of the wall or architectural elements or the the position of the architectural element vis-a-vis -vis that perspective mm -hmm. so yeah or exaggerating like the bow in the facade of the um waterloo apartments yeah yeah so that that's basically you know what we we, we try to do that in all our buildings it's, it's a sort of it's, it's a spatial game a spatial effect which we we like to do um again it probably came out of that very early project the pitched roof house um that we realized that the triangulation created these effects when you met the diamond on the corner um and that was something yeah that we also did in the glebe house so we've continued on that strategy um ever since into our other buildings so that's something which now we like to play with and we and we also can, uh communicate that to our clients and they actually they, they embrace it you know readily quite, you know, so that's really good. Yeah, and also I've noticed by doing these geometrical operations, one thing that's really consistent in many of projects that you have this simultaneous experience of multiple spaces at the same time. So when in one, yes. room, you actually get to experience the, the room or the outdoor, but then not just one outdoor, one, you know, room next door, but then multiple outdoors at the same time. So I think that's really make it really beautiful, the space. Yeah. Hmm. But also an a perspective effect is not something which we, we you know you know involves you know flattening a corner or, or or accentuating a perception, but also you know a simple idea of layering a space you know through screens you know very much like a Chinese garden how they layer spaces that in is in some way is also a persp a perspectival. It, it doesn't necessarily need to involve you know, geometric moves, you know, it can be simply of just layering and really focusing on the scale of each layer of each, uh, you know, the gaps or the, um, the solid void relationship of each layer relative to the, to the other layers. Um, so you can really 
extend the for, uh, extend the foreground or bring the foreground closer to the building, you know, uh, through the study or application of these layers. So, so um, you know, it can be done through various um, ways. So it's not just geometry, but you, you can also do it through layering of different materials too. Yeah, like we didn't show you on the Kuji house, um, but when you're inside the space, um, we've made sure that the edge of the balcony blocks the transition from the water to the land. So by blocking that view, you bring the water, it appears much, much closer. So there's all these effects that can, um, yeah, improve the quality of the internal space. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I actually still very amazed by uh, the story uh, for your very first project mm. that you are required to, um, let's say, present the story, or present the design rather than use, let's say, the architect usually familiar with the tool drawings and or let's say rendering or other visuals, but you're actually required to use word. Mm. Um, it reminds me about one of the story I heard from, I think it's office from uh, Tatiana Bilbo that she banned mm -hmm. rendering in her house, uh, in her office. So the best way for her is to communicate with client with collage, which creates in her words, it creates this platform so that everyone um, in this project can create their own way, live in their own way to imagine this design. Mm -hmm. So I guess I want to ask you is, did you find it difficult at the beginning when you were required to presenting the design, the project with the word and how does it affect your, um, I guess, design yes. process later yes, on? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, that client was such a busy person that we, you know, yeah. it was quite rare that we could meet face to face because he was always, you know, in the courts and he had a very strict time frame. And a lot of the times he was in Hong Kong traveling back and forth between Sydney and Hong Kong. So at the beginning it was very difficult and, you know, a, a basic, a basic principle of trying to sort of establish coordinates for your for for the design which you're describing. You know, you start using the north arrow and the south and the east west. You know that the the, uh, the uh, you know the direction. So you know the northern the northern wall does this, the southern wall does this. So those basic coordinates are important. So once you establish the design that way, um, I think the, the the sort of adjectives that you use and metaphors that you use are very very important. Mm. Because, um, you know, if you mention a certain adjective or metaphor, it, it loses a certain visual image to a particular person. You know, and, 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 and that sort of, uh, and that sort of uh, really much depends on, you know, their profession, the, the cultural background. So very early on, you know, we, in some ways, uh, I was using metaphors and the client would say, hmm, <laughs> the metaphor would be, you know, it would, would give him a, an image which he didn't quite like. So, so I think, you know, as we met more and more, and occasionally we did meet face to face, um, you know, it cleared up the confusion. Um, but um, it was but definitely challenging. It was challenging. Yeah, I re remember quite a few times where we'd put our case forward and it just wouldn't pass. So we'd have to go back to the drawing board and. Mm -hmm. Um, come back with another explanation. Mm. It was also, uh, in some way, uh, very early on, um, the client, it's just quite embarrassing. He knew more about Renaissance architecture than we did. Um, he had read all of Alberti's treatises and, and, and he knew about Palladio and he had traveled to Italy and uh, Rome and Venice and Florence. You know, he knew everything about Renaissance architecture. He would start talking about it. <laughs> So, so I think we're very fortunate for our first client. Fortunate, but it was challenging. <laughs> very interesting. And I think it also reminds me um, like how when we are teaching students at school that we keep telling them like the verbal language is equally important. I guess the tendency architects tend to express their emotion and reaction for the buildings. So while yes. it's actually not the best way to kind of use, communicate with different levels of audience, especially for the client. Yes. I mean, you know, for us also, the way we, we delivered the concept or the argument, the way we presented the argument was very, very important. Um, you, know, he, you know, I find people from the legal profession are very, very logical. Mm. 
but also at the yeah, same so we yeah we developed a more logical way of presenting our designs from that i think and it had to be very much grounded in specifics in the site the brief the structural requirements all those things um and yeah that enabled us to be very logical in um explaining our designs and i think that has helped us a lot going forward and also i think we realized through that that exercise is you know the the role of precedence in architecture and the role of precedence in law are very very similar mm. because both professions are very much uh the precedence plays a major role i mean for law it allows the law to evolve over time um you know change over time through through precedences, they, they look at previous cases to see how the previous case can, can apply to their present case, which they're, you know, assessing. And I think architecture does the same thing. And, and during our discussion with that client, we realized, for example, you know, that, you know, for a, a lawyer, for a judge to write, or to write a judgment in itself is a creative act. It's very, very similar to architecture. So um, he was able to explain how a judgment in some way the way he writes it, you know, he talks about symmetry, he talks about continuous logic loops in, in, in his judgment and the way he writes his judgments and thinks about his judgments. So in some way we, we realize, you know, something which we never thought about law and architecture, but they are quite similar uh, in, in terms of the way they look at the world or, you know, you know the whole issue of, you know, we always, we never imagined law as being creative. We imagine law as being quite dry but in some way, it is very, very creative, almost as creative as architecture. It is as creative as architecture. I mean, if you speak to a lawyer about creativity, they, they'll look at you and say, no, it's not creative. The law is very black and white. You know, it's not about shades of gray, you know, but in some way, law is about shades of gray, you know. So that was very interesting. We, we developed a very, very, um, you know, great relationship with that client. That's very interesting, yeah. Mm. And then you always think that you, when you talk to a lawyer, you don't want the lawyer to be too creative. And then maybe like yeah, that can actually get you to the point, you know, get you the result. But actually to get to there, you actually need to creatively, you know, work around and look into these um, clauses. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, what's, what's really interesting is that, that some of our best clients are lawyers. Yeah. And in, in some way they're frustrated architects. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of their, you know, a lot of their lawyers that they, they, they um, have an um, amazing collection of, of artwork, famous artwork. So they are, they appreciate art um, and creativity. So that they make very good clients. <laughs> yeah. Does that, that, I wonder, yeah. does that help you to, you know, because a lot of your projects of, you know, presentation are framed from the point of view, how you also creative, uh, creatively um, deal with the local re uh, local regulations, building codes, and all these constraints that come from, you know, public policy and you know these uh, local laws. I wonder, a how do you do it, you know, as an architect, and whether your communication with the lawyer, client, or people, you know, working actually uh, with these matters will help you um, doing mm -hmm. these decisions. Yeah. yeah, I think initially it did help. Definitely. Yeah. Um, um, and then we realized that, that the law isn't black and white. There are these gaps. Yeah. And and it, you really basically focus on these gaps, you know, so that helped us. And and, and also with our knowledge of precedences, we knew that, you know, certain precedents like uh, interstitial space, you know, which can be interpreted as neither inside or outside. But when you presented with a, a, uh, a rule, which saying the FSR is measured you know, from the inside wall and assumes a very distinct inside and outside. There are, there are certain, you know, architectural um, concepts or, or strategies which do fall outside the law, planning law. And we realize that, and it's, it's quite interesting if you really study it that way. Mm. I'm going to continue and read a question from our audience from probably a, um, a young student or a young graduate um, of architecture. Uh, Jensen Chu um, has a question how would you suggest a new graduate or young architect to find their first clients? Very Ooh. straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> <Find their> first. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I have to say, you know, my, my, my dad, uh, you know, used to be a businessman and he always used to say to me, it's all about your network and all about your contacts. Mm. Um, I think that is very, very important, you know, at the beginning. 
mm. you know, it, it's it's a network, it's your contacts. Um, but then after that, it's it's the ability to for you to, um, or it's your skill as an architect, um, but also the way you can you can communicate your ideas to that client is also very very important. Mm. But also understand that whatever project you take on first you're likely to get that same type of project again <laughs> so if you do an interior you're probably going to get more interiors if, if you do an apartment building you're probably going to get more apartment buildings so if you can <laughs> you should try to network in the areas that are likely to give you the type of building that you want to do so for example if you want to do large buildings you know you start going to you know people you know, in a, in a development company, you know, you start to like in, in Sydney, you know, there's Lend Leases, there's Mervax, you start to meet people within that circle um, if you want to do that type of building. So in terms of what Steph says, it's, you know, you really have to figure out, we didn't do it, but, and that's why it's taken us so long, um, <laughs> but now that we know, um, you know, if you know what sort of type of building you want to start off with, start mixing with the people who, who can facilitate that. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, we found that you have to build something. It's really important. Or when we started anyway, it was very important that you build something. Um, and we also found that if you speak to the client abstractly um, and, and, and speak in terms that it doesn't, it never relates to their, to their particular brief or their site, mm. they switch off very, very quickly. You know they become not interested and they say well um why don't we talk about my yeah my brief my you know what i want you know so you, you can't speak to the client abstractly also you have to speak about their project all the time and relate it back to their project that's very great advice yeah so in your last um uh, i think at the last uh, project you present was the uh, the housing project in Waterloo Apartments. How I really curious that how is this a transaction feel like one having practiced doing uh, suburban houses for such a long time? Then um, I wouldn't say all of a sudden, but then transform into a large, larger scale, which into an urban context. How um, what what's what's the interesting thing happened during this process, and how do you feel you how to adjust to this new uh, type of design yeah, it, you need to pull out yeah it's very very different you have a lot less control mm. there's often a project manager who controls how much you're involved how much we are allowed to do on the project whether we're allowed on site every week or whether we can only come out once a month so it, it's very very different to a house because in a house we're usually controlling everything we control the consultant team yeah so you find that you're having to um, have a strategy to deal with the fact that you're not going to be involved as much as you want or you're not going to have the control you would normally have. So, um, yeah, you've really got to strategize how you can achieve your outcome um, when everything isn't going to be controlled by you. Um, so allowing for, um, like, not that necessarily having the best tradespeople or um, not having the best materials or detailing because of um, the abilities or the budget um, of the builders. So, um, yeah. yeah. You need to really create, a, uh, for, for an apartment building, a hierarchy of things you're willing to lose or things which you're willing to uh, you know, give, up on. give up on. But the, there are certain things which you're not going to give up on and you need to decide that straight away. Uh -huh. um, and, and then once you work that out, um, you know, we find that, you know, clients, you know, developers, that they like to bargain, you know, okay, we give you this, but, you know, do we have to do, we give you Y, but do we need to do X, for example? Um, so you need to work out what your priorities are uh, in, in terms of your design, but also from, you know, moving from a, a single house to an apartment building, from a design point of view, the issue of scale is, is we found very, very difficult at the beginning. So, you know, we would detail our houses using fine screens, 
um, you know, very fine steelwork. And it didn't translate to a building, you know, which is eight stories high because you don't visually see it. You know, you don't, you don't feel the presence of that detail. Um, so also it took us a while to understand or, or to understand the scale in, in terms of the way we're detailing the building and also the way we're conceptualizing the building, you know, moving from a house to a, a larger building. Uh, that was quite difficult. And we, you know, went through a whole lot of uh, different options. Yeah. And with an apartment building, because we're only there because of a, a council design excellence process that the developer is required to do, the developer doesn't really want us there. Like it's um, a very strange relationship. So they're only um, getting the design excellence process because they have to. And they get that bonus in so, floor space. So, and at the end of the process, we have to sign off that we're happy that they've carried out that design excellence. Mm. So it becomes this bargaining. So they're trying to chip off as much as possible and we're battling to try and keep as much as possible. So it's a complete opposite to a, a housing project. You're just constantly battling to keep mm. your design intact. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's an interesting process. You know, uh, you know, with a house, the client meets a lot of architects and then they hire the architect that they like, you know. Um, with, and they, with... they encourage you. They want you to do your best. Yes. Whereas in this developer... It's, it's, it's like, it's like, an, it's like a arranged marriage. Yeah. <laughs> You're just forced together. You know, the external forces bring, bring both of you together, you know, and you just have to work together. Which I want to, like, um, continue that by asking you, because you also mentioned your interest in the oneness, right? The, the, the singular power of the idea in your yes. in the project. And, but, you know, a project is never gonna be, you know, your, you know, just the architect's um, show. Uh, it's always this battle. There's always this pressure from, you know, the, the regulations, your, your, your um, relationship with client, you know, there's always these um, multiple forces that's acting on the, project and how do you still maintain the oneness of the idea or maintain the, the singularity of the idea? I think that comes to this to the special strategy in which you develop for that particular project. If you are able to, for example, through that special strategy, answer or, or demonstrate that you respond to all the conditions which or all the, all the forces which you're, you're faced with as a designer, then it, it, in some way, it doesn't get compromised. They actually embrace the, uh, the overall concept. Mm -hmm. um, we've never had a client which didn't understand that. They actually quite like it because you're answering every one of their, their problems or any, every one of their concerns or you're, or you're addressing their, you know, um, their desires in a certain way. Um, but that, that idea of an overall or oneness, you know, what Ali Ahi talks about or and uh, or Fashid in the functional format, I think she uses the word uh, transversal form, I think. Um, but, um, you know, if you ground it in, in the client's brief and the site conditions, we have experienced uh, the experiences that they, they embrace it, you know. They... Yeah. yeah, a lot of people say, oh, how do you get the clients to build those sort of houses, for example? Um, but because they're so intrinsically related to exactly what the client's asking for, it hasn't been an issue at all. <laughs> yeah, it's but like what, a hyper-rational response to the specifics of what they're asking for. Maybe we can have one more question. Um, if we have one more question from the audience. Um, Thank you for sharing the inspiring works. And I particularly appreciate the dialogue um, between your project with municipal regulations and um, the sense of urban contextuality or locality. I'm curious if you want to explore the rural or the natural side of Australia or projects perhaps in different cultural contexts like in the foreign country. Yeah, um, that, that's something which we would like to do. Um, we, we, we have worked in rural areas of Australia. Um, they, the, the projects, unfortunately, or one project, uh, unfortunately, wasn't built because the clients sold the property. 
But uh, you know, that was a very, very different experience because um, in some way the limitations, there were a lot less limitations on the rural side, a um, lot less things to sort of, um, what's the word? Lot, lot, you know, less cues in terms of where to start, you know, for the design process. Um, but it's something which, you know, we would like to embrace. Um, <laughs> We'd love to, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think what's very interesting is um, if you're designing a house, it, it, even within Australia, whether it's in an urban or suburban context or a rural uh, context, um, the, the, the tradesmen uh, that you, and the builders that you work with have different skills. Um, and it'd be great to really um, think about the project you know, within that framework. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. Uh, not to superimpose what we have dealt with, what we have done before, mm -hmm. um, but to embrace um, what they are doing, how they are building, the materials they use, uh, their cultural background, and somehow um, you know, coming, up with, coming up with something which is very, very unique. Okay. Um, I know it's late in Sydney. I just want, <laughs> before, we, before we end, I just want to share with our members in the audience that we have on October 20th at 6.30 p.m. we have a movie night and the newly um, open central market renovation. Um, and then we have a building tour at Rosewood Hotel at, on, on October the 23rd at 4 p.m. So please join us for the um, events coming this month. And I want to say thank you for, um, to Tony and Stephanie for joining us on a Friday night um, for you. And I think I, I learned a lot um, by looking at your project and listening to your presentation. And thank you, Yi, for joining us for the discussion. And thank all our um, audience and members for joining us tonight. And I hope um, we can continue this dialogue and hopefully we can see more of your work, Tony and Stephanie, in the future. Thank you. Right. It's thank been you. a pleasure, Chang and, and Sam. Thank you for we inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. We can. You Thank too. you. <laughs> Good night. Good night.